And now, from Pasadena, it's CCN Sunrise with Sunita Joshua Madison, Paulo Alejandria, the Crown City News team, and the CCN Sunrise segment stars. It's time to wake up San Gabriel Valley with CCN Sunrise. Good morning and welcome to CCN Sunrise. We have a packed show for you today. Bob McClure is here to talk about how California ranks among business-friendly states and we have much more. I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. And I'm Paulo Alejandria. We're also going to be talking to attorney Patricia Corrales about the topic that's buzzing all over the nation, immigration. Can't wait to get the show started, Sunita. Absolutely. Welcome but, back, by the way. Thank you. But, you know, we really have to start with talking about the Malaysian airline yeah. uh, flight, MH17, that was shot down. Um, it's just such a tragedy, and Malaysian Airlines is, again, caught up in yeah, this Yeah, unfortunately, drama. They're, they're, they're dragged into another news-making headline that's not very favorable. Uh, from what we understand, I mean, there's no responsibility put upon Malaysian Airlines, of course, because, of course, this was a surface-to-air missile. How can you really safeguard against that. Absolutely, and you know, um, there was just reports by the Ukraine government, and they had released some audio showing that the um, rebels had acknowledged taking responsibility for shooting down that commercial uh, jet, but they really thought they were shooting down a military jet. Quite a huge mistake. Yeah, I mean, reports indicate that there was a military cargo sh jet that was shot down over the Ukraine just a couple of days prior. So you can easily assume that this was more of the same uh, happening here and you know almost uh, you know 200 families affected by this this is just so sad 300 in fact yeah, crew members included I mean yeah it's, it's a terrible tragedy and um, you know speaking of tragedies the Gaza um, situation that's happening there erupting again between the Israelis and Palestinians yeah, just the latest chapter in this highly contentious area of the world absolutely and you know uh, the Hamas government rejected another ceasefire um, offer and so Israel is continuing with uh, a ground assault and mm. but you know the sad part is the number of deaths that are, are occurring on both sides is very uneven yeah I mean when you talk about ideologies what I mean at the end of the day you know people and innocent people are being killed uh, people who don't need to be killed and we you know we our hearts I mean I just really go out to them and, and hope everything works out and they're able to broker peace but it's something that they've been trying to do for the better part of, I guess, everybody's everybody's life is they've been trying to broker some sort of peace in this area. Yeah, you know, I have a friend in the news business who says he doesn't like to talk about um, the Middle East because it just feels like it never gets solved. Yeah. And it's true, it's just, you know, one incident after the other and Generations, uh, generations upon generations, as old as the history of the world. So many people have been trying to, you know, do these negoti negotiations and, and they don't quite stick, so yeah. I don't know what, what's going to happen, but we have some news in we our got local some area. News, definitely. Now, here's a look at some of the headlines making news right here in the San Gabriel Valley. And now, CCN Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. Police say 35 year old Johnny Zell Smith of Pasadena shot and killed three people and injured two others before police arrested him. CCN's Tony Mead has the rest of that story. Saturday, July 12th at about 4.20 p.m., Pasadena police received several 911 calls from residents reporting shots fired in the 1700 block of Summit Avenue. 911 At the scene, a woman lay dead on the sidewalk, and police say a good Samaritan who tried to help her in heavy gunfire also lost his life. Investigators say the suspect, 35-year-old John Easel Smith, opened fire on the whole neighborhood, including police officers, with a rifle before barricading himself inside a home. Police say during the standoff, the suspect calls 911, telling dispatcher Diane Marin that he had killed someone and that he wanted to give himself up. She calmly talks him into surrendering in a 20-minute tense negotiation. Now officers are applauding her for keeping her cool. My main concern was the safety of the officers and any of anyone out in the street. Um, I've never received a call from someone who had just committed a crime, especially of that magnitude. Mainly, I was concerned that this person still had weapons, or if they did or if they didn't. I was concerned what they were planning to do <coughs> to themselves and to the officers. The Pasadena Police Department held a press conference with Mayor Bill Bogart, Glendale Fire Department, and other officials who helped. 
All here say the shooting on Summit Avenue was a tragic and horrific incident. Authorities say the suspect murdered 71-year-old Louis Aguilar and 59-year-old Maria Teresa Aguilar. Two others who were hurt in the attack suffered from minor to moderate injuries. Pasadena police said they're still sorting out all the details of this investigation. Smith has been charged with murder and attempted murder. In Pasadena, Tony Mead, CCN. Congressman Adam Schiff announced $5 billion for an earthquake early warning system for the West Coast. The system is based on a limited system developed by Caltech, UC Berkeley, and the University of Washington, as well as the U.S. Geological Survey. It's designed to give the precious seconds needed to brace for an earthquake with life-saving measures, such as automatically stopping trains, securing the power grid, giving doctors time to pause surgeries, and letting people take cover. It was estimated that the system would cost $16.1 million to construct, operate, and maintain each year. FEMA estimates show that the cost of, uh, for the U.S. to fund earthquakes uh, is $5 billion average over the long term. So this system will help defray those costs. Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors unanimously approved Laura's Law initiated by 5th District uh, Supervisor Mike Antonovich. Named after Laura Wilcox, a 19-year-old mental health worker killed by an individual suffering from delusions and mental illness who refused treatment, Laura's Law is a court-ordered outpatient or antipsychotic treatment program for violent individuals refusing treatment. Laura's Law has proven to significantly improve the lives of program of participants, decrease incarceration, reduce homelessness, and enhance public safety. Said Supervisor Antonovich, it provides a humane alternative to the revolving door of mental hospitals, jails, and the street. A previous limited pilot program resulted in a 78% reduction in incarcerations and a 77% reduction in hospitalizations for program patients. Laura's Law is patterned by New York State's Kendrick's Law. Kendra's Law. And in our morning buzz, let's talk about spaying and neutering, both of us Why being not? pet owners here. Absolutely. I gotta admit to you, I my guy is not spayed or neutered. He's not. He is, is he out there not. about, you know, spreading he's, his seed? Uh, he's yeah, he's doing the town. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, this might affect you a little bit. Um, they there was a city council meeting this past week that was packed. Um, people on both sides are very passionate, obviously, mm. because people are passionate about their pets. Um, but there is a uh, um, they're calling for a mandating of spaying and neutering of, of all that dogs and cats completely have to. over six months old. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some exceptions for, you know, show dogs and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, certain, breed, uh, certain breeds and, um, or any animals with health concerns. Yeah, and that's the reason why some people wouldn't want to do that because they are breeding. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is your dog, are you? He's a pure, he's a pure pug. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's a prize, yeah. so I can understand that. But people were very yeah. heated at the city council meeting, and we're going to take a li uh, listen to some of the comments made. Uh, you still walk into our shelter today, and you see the stray dogs and the stray cats. That just never stops. It's an ongoing flow. So anything we can do to save one animal's life uh, or keep one animal from being uh, born that's not wanted is uh, a positive step forward. I do a lot of animal rescue work and I see way too many cats and dogs that have been abandoned, neglected, or abused. There are tens of thousands of them on shelters and on Pet Finder. We owe it to them to help bring down their numbers and prevent any more suffering. I'm a big uh, supporter of spay and neuter because there's a lot of backyard breeders out there and we need to leave the breeding to the responsible people, which is the AKC, UKC. Um, I mean, especially with pit bulls, you see a lot of backyard breeders. I'm against it because I feel like we can have the residents of Pasadena um, do the same thing. I have been, and other residents of the city of Pasadena, my neighbors, have been paying for spaying and neutering for ever since I've been here. In that letter, I quoted extensively from the Fix Austin blog, who is against mandatory spay and neuter ordinances because they are ineffective wherever they have been tried. Early spay and neuter in animals has lots of adverse physical effects. Animals are experiencing increased re rates of cancer, increased problems with structural health, increased temperament problems. I want to make very clear, I'm not opposed to spay and neutering, 
But what I am opposed to is laws that have the potential to disproportionately affect lower income people. And when you start to pass these kinds of laws without the infrastructure in place and without the possibility for low income or for, for low cost spay neuter options, you really run into problems. So, you know, the Humane Society had came out and they're all for this mandate. You know, when you go to the Humane Society site, yeah. uh, website, so many of those dogs are pit bulls. I mean, and I think that's originally how this started. Yeah, it was because of pit bulls, correct? Well, yes, uh, this is a pet, pet cause uh -huh. of uh, Councilman Steve Madison, who is really, you know, kind of against pit bulls and um, the ones who aren't spayed and neutered. Uh, you hear some pretty scary stories involving pit bulls. And, and that's yeah. what he's saying. But, you know, uh, on the other side, people are saying it's it's not the dogs, it's, it's, it's the, the owners. It's, yeah, it's the owner. But, you know, it doesn't take away from the fact that there are a number of incidences out there. And, and there is, like, an overpopulation of, of animals. I mean, that's just clear-cut fact, isn't is it not? Well, you know, it's definitely the case, but that's what people on the other side are saying, that this isn't going to address the situation yeah. because uh, responsible owners, they're going to go ahead and do this anyway. Right. It's not going to address the, the strays that are out there. Yeah. And yeah. I've always heard, I don't know if you could call it a myth, but if you spay or neuter your, your, your dog or cat, then you're, it's, you're, your pet's going to be lazy. It's going to be fat and lazy. That's, that's kind of what I heard. My kitty is just, you know, he's just Nobody chilling. said anything about Luna. <laughs> no one said no, anything about Luna. Nobody ever says anything about Luna. <laughs> She's very active. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and they're also saying that this is really going to hurt the, the poor people because if they don't go ahead. Because now they have to. Now they would have to. And there's a $60 fine if, if they don't. And not everyone can afford that, mm -hmm. you know. So um, we'll see. There was a 5-3 vote in favor for moving this forward. And they have 60 days where they're going to do a first reading of the bill. So uh, there's going to be a lot yeah, more keep comments Keep an eye on, on that. This. See what the developments are in that case. But um, we're going to talk about another ban, a proposed ban in Pasadena. And we have uh, Wesley Rudiman here um, who's going to talk about why he thinks it's important to ban styrofoam in the city of Pasadena. Welcome to the show. Oh, welcome. Good morning. Good yeah. Idea. No, it's a wonderful opportunity. The city is a leader in green practices and sustainability and it's a next step they're looking at right now is reducing foam waste, styrofoam waste. So specifically things like uh, single-use cups and plates that too often end up in the gutters and then in into our open spaces and down into the ocean when it finally rains. Now is this geared towards, you know, more of the restaurant community or who is this geared towards? Well, there are different ways communities can do this. So over 70 cities in California have already adopted this policy, as well as some major U.S. cities, New York City, Washington, D.C. actually just passed it in June of this year. And most of the policies are focused at uh, carryout. So take out containers when you go pick up lunch or something. And those are often or far too often end up into the rivers, into the public spaces, into our gutters and uh, break down easily. And they're not recyclable. They're not biodegradable and they're actually harmful to your health, if, especially if you heat up food that you, you took out in the microwave. Something you should oh, definitely not do. Sometimes, and That's there's like plenty, holes. Because I thought in this day and age where everything is so green friendly and you know, it's, it's hip to recycle, that these styrofoam containers would be biodegradable or at least have a measure of biodegradable. And you said there isn't. No, no, by and large they are not, and they're also not recyclable. So as soon as they're contaminated with food, they have to go directly to the landfill. There's nothing we can really do with them. But you know, I'm gonna be honest with you, Wesley. I mean, I'm uh, all for banning styrofoam. I see it melt. But you know, when I have to go buy for a large group, and I'm gonna be honest with you, I went and bought coffee, uh, co coffee styrofoam glasses. Mm -hmm. Because when I go in there, all my intention is to you know, buy something alternative. But when you look at the cost, it's, it's hard to make that choice to not buy styrofoam. And you know, a little bit later, we're going to talk about how California <coughs> is not very friendly to small businesses. And this is going to be a huge cost burden for some of these businesses yeah, trying to remove styrofoam. Yeah, what do you, how do you address overhead. that? Yeah, well, that's absolutely a fear. But the studies that actually have been done on the, pro uh, the products that are out there in the marketplace right now, alternatives that are recyclable or are compostable, there's only on average uh, two percent or two cent more per product cost differential. So two cents to the average consumer. I mean, look, we have to pay 10 cents for a bag now. Right. Uh, two cents is, is nothing. And for that reason, McDonald's actually phased out all styrofoam products in the 1990s. So it, it can be done. So the cost far outweighs the, I mean, the, the benefit far outweighs the cost. Yeah, no, absolutely. The environmental costs, the social costs, and the health costs are very high. So that nominal two cent or a couple mm -hmm. cent 
uh, greater cost I, isn't in the long I don't run. know. I wish when I went to the store it was a two cents difference because, <laughs> yes, it would be an easy choice, but it was, it was significant for regular consumers. Is this aimed at regular consumers at all or, or just um, at more businesses? Most of the policies passed in California to date have focused on the, the businesses themselves, so uh, distribution of single-use containers, but some, of the, some communities have actually gone a step further and, and phased them out entirely from retail establishments. So exactly like when you go to the grocery store and you want to purchase some cups or some plates. Uh, so th their, their policies cover, um, cover that as well. And I'm just curious, so uh, with a ban on styrofoams like you propose, I mean, what are some alternatives for your more your fast food uh, establishments? Like, what would they be using? What's the, McDonald's doing Yeah, now? what would they be doing? How would they kind of combat against this and keep costs down? Yeah, so for example, you go to Starbucks, you go to McDonald's, when you get a, a cup of coffee, it, they're paper products and they have a little sleeve that keeps, you know, keeps it from getting too hot. So that's one example. They're also, um, they make plastics that look like plastic actually out of the cornstarch. So it's alternative and it's compostable. And I just recently saw Domino's, I think it was one of the pizza places, was going to have a, an eatable box. What? I guess maybe that's what, what? they need to be. Okay. We just need to eat our way through this world. Just be completely degradable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what will become of us. I think we'll turn into styrofoam then. Absolutely. But thank you so much for coming here, Wesley, and talking about this. Thanks thank for you. Me. And when we come back, how to raise kids with a healthy sense of self. Dr. Michelle Meyer will be here to talk about that in her Family to Family segment. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. And now, CCN Brown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. Kids today are bombarded by images of how they should act and be. Dr. Michelle Myers here to tell us how to raise kids with a healthy sense of self. Welcome. And now I want to tell you, my kid probably has too healthy of a sense of self. So. But you know, there are a lot of kids and adults struggling. So yes. how can we help these kids? Here, the problem I think we see is that there's these snowplow parents. Have you heard of the term snowplow? No. So the snowplow parent is the parent that they want to make sure that everything is okay and their child never makes mistakes and everything's perfect. But then we don't teach our we don't teach our children resilience or a good sense of self, I mean, because your sense of self is dependent. Mistakes. It is it's good enough. to make mistakes. Yeah. Mistakes teach us how to cope with problems. Right. Yes. Snowplow, though, how does that work? What, I mean, they're uh, basically, like clearing it all the way. Clear, 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 out, clear out the yeah. way. They can't make a mistake, and when a child does make a mistake, they make excuses for them. Oh. oh, my child was tired today, or they're having a bad day today, or there's something that the child de never is required to take ownership for their behavior. Yeah. And I don't yes. want to get too intense, but a parent kind of acts as an enabler at that point, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Wow. And what can parents do? You know, the U.S. Department of Human Health Services has created some really specific guidelines on how to create healthy children. You know, it's important for, for parents to monitor their children, but at the same time, we really need to let children sort of develop age appropriately on their own and kind of learn from their mistakes. 
So the first thing that we really talk, we really stress is good talking, good listening. Communication is one of the most important protective factors against risky behaviors in children and adolescents. Next thing, show and tell. That old adage, do as I say, not as I do, does not work with children, and then we don't really teach children what's important to us. You know, and with that, if you want to teach your child a certain value, you also need to tell them why, and then you need to demonstrate that value. Um, another thing we talk about is teaching kids to be with kids. Kids need to learn to be, to, to be friends, to be socially conscious, you know, to be aware of how their behavior impacts others and to teach compassion. Another thing is rules. There are very simple sort of do's and don'ts to rules. When you're giving a child a rule, you want to first make eye contact, make, make sure you have the child's attention, be very specific, give concrete rules, and if you're gonna set a limit, you need to really enforce that limit. The things we want to avoid is don't ask questions, don't be vague, and don't be sort of wishy-washy on what you expect from your child. You know, another thing that we I really talk to parents a lot and I stress is, you know, teaching kids self-respect. I think that's what, you know, a lot of the problems we have now is that if you don't teach a kid to value themselves, they're really not going to value others around them, and they're really not going to understand how their behavior impacts others. And I think, you know, Sunita, back to what you're saying is about, you know, your kid, you said your child might have too much confidence, and I don't think too much confidence <laughs> is bad, kid. but I do think, you know, that children really need to kind of be aware of how their behavior impacts others, and they need to make mistakes sometimes. Because as you were saying, Paula, is that making mistakes is okay, because it really teaches us sort of that life, you know, we're gonna make mistakes sometimes, and we someone's sure not gonna be following us stop. around and well, fixing well, for us. Well, speaking to that, because there was a, a woman, a working mom, I think she was in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, who got arrested because her child was at the park yes. by herself. Yes. By, by uh, him or herself. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you want to have these resilient kids, but then, you know, where do parents stand? Do they helicopter, do they not? Yeah, I think that's an interesting case because I think, the, I think when I was reading about that, the mom actually didn't have childcare, so she really didn't have a choice with that. So that, that's, I think that might be a little bit of a different situation. Yeah. Okay, All well, right. thank you for yes. that. All right, always a pleasure. The Sriracha Company sure got a taste of the spicy business climate here in California. In his Money and Market segment, Bob McClure is going to tell us what grade California got in its business friendliness. And hint, if your kid got this grade, they would be grounded. Coming up next. Me dijeron que no debía soñar. Me llamaron pedazo de basura y juraron que eso es todo lo que llegaría a ser. Dijeron que una botella no podría ver el océano. Ríndete. Regresa al basurero. Pero no les hice caso. Me abrí paso. Y ahora estoy aquí. Soy lo que siempre quise ser. Full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. When you're out there, there's no telling what you'll find. Look at you. There are some moments only the forest can inspire. <laughs> Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Well, Sunita, you went to what's regarded as a public Ivy school, the University of Michigan. So it uh, um, leads me to believe that you didn't have a problem hitting your grades in high school. Well, 
you know, I, I do have Asian parents, so uh, they always stress that. Then what's my excuse? What is I'm your Asian. excuse? I don't know. Not all A's? Mm, not, not smart all, cookie? I, I had some A's, I had some B's, and I had some F's too. I, I ran the whole gamut. What were your F's in, gym? No, no, I never got an F in gym. Well, Come on okay. now. <laughs> what was it, business then? Business, yeah, and it's, it's evident today with how I handle money or, uh -oh. you know, my lack thereof skills. A lot of people have that challenge. <laughs> but speaking of business, a new study looks at how small businesses grade their state and how business friendly they are. And just like yours truly, California got an F. Oh boy, and uh, his segment star Bob McClure is here to tell us why. Thank you, Paulo and Sunita. Uh, you know, owning a small business for many people has, has always been a part of the American dream. Along with the house with a white picket fence and the 1.5 children, many people view owning your own business as the real expression of, of freedom and uh, being American. And if you go back and look at a Gallup so survey done a number of years ago, 71% of high school students wanted to own their own business, which is kind of a high number, 71%. But if you look within that number, you find out something even more impressive. Only 26% of them saw making money as the number one motivation for starting a business. And if you actually look at a University of Nebraska study from 2006, only 6% of actual business owners said making a lot of money is the main reason they open their own business. So the question is, why do that? Why open your own business? Why have your own business? Turns out the reason is many people just want to do something well. They want to improve their community or their state or maybe make improvements on a global stage which is all well and good, but then you have to figure, well, if we're taking it, looking at a global stage, what's the best country to own your own business? And without a doubt, the answer there is the United States. <coughs> the United States has brought us everything from the Swiffer to cures for cancer, from the local mom and pop restaurant to Walmart. So we clearly have a great track record of starting businesses and getting them off the ground. And so then you have to say, within the United States, we have 50 states. Where would California rank? We've got the sun, we've got the beaches, we have the mountains. Every New Year's Day, people across the world turn on their televisions and watch the Rose Parade, and they see the snow-capped San Gabriel Mountains and the beaches and the beautiful sunshine and say, what a great place. So again, how many of the 50 states could possibly be better than California? Turns out the answer is about 49 of them. California is a wonderful place, but a terrible place to start a business in many respects. A survey done by Thumbtack.com, sponsored by the Kaufman Foundation, found that when we look at things like ease of starting a business, ease of hiring, regulation, tax code, labor practices, zoning, we find that California does fairly poorly. If we look at this last graphic, we'll see that California in the blue is ranked near the bottom along with Illinois and Rhode Island as the least business friendly states. Whereas at the top of the list is number one, unfortunately, is Texas. Texas being good at something has really bothered me since the 2006 Rose Bowl when they beat my USC Trojans. All that aside, Texas, Utah, Idaho, Virginia tend to be the best, most business friendly states. So the question is, I guess, uh, Sunita, Paulo, maybe you can tell me, if you were going to start a business, would you pull up stakes and leave the state? I have to believe that you, you'd be in your best interest to do that. Yeah, I'm get, staying here. You st know? Stack the odds in your favor. Because I don't know, I'm not one of the 20% I want to make money in a business. So there you go. I'm an altruist. You know, I know we have a lot of regulations here, but I mean, aren't some of those regulations also making us leaders in the country in things like environmental laws and things like that? So there's a give and take there. It's a two-way street and definitely we are leaders in some things. Certainly technology is one of the areas where, where we're a leader. Entertainment as well. But then a lot of our rules and regulations make, for example, many motion pictures are not shot in California. Many of the musicians playing on the soundtracks come from other countries, uh, other states, because of the cost of doing business here. So they still have yet, uh, in a regulatory sense, to find a good balance. All right. Well, All right. I'm still staying here. <laughs> but I might not start a small business. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I hope this, uh, this gig uh, keeps going. Yeah, yeah, this is a pretty good gig. <laughs> well, in our next half hour, water wasters will now have to pay a hefty fine, $500.
Find out how the drought is affecting those trying to keep a green law. Coming up next. There's no place like home. Getting home safely is just a click away. And choosing the right seat for your little one's age and size will take you down the road to safer travels. How can I ever thank you enough? Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. <gasps> Staring contest! You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. And now, from Pasadena, it's CCN Sunrise with Sunita Joshua Madison, Paulo Alejandria, the Crown City News team, and the CCN Sunrise segment stars. It's time to wake up San Gabriel Valley with CCN Sunrise. We're back with our second half hour of CCN Sunrise. I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. And I'm Paulo Alejandria. Paul, it's really funny. There's a venture capitalist who actually got enough signatures um, to get on the November ballot uh, to break up the state, in, the state of California, into six different sections because he says it's just ungovernable. Um, there's too many different people and, and uh, you know areas, and we just need to split it up. No, California is fine the way it is. Coming six together. different regions. But I found it really funny. There was a, a LA Times uh -huh. political cartoon revising how they would break up those six states. So the top of the state is listed as the weed area. Yeah, because... <laughs> and they're saying it's for medical purposes. Uh -huh. um, and then the, the northern you part... Your the, Merlot, the your Merlot, your wine country. Agent. Yeah. Uh, then it's all dried up in the drought area, in the nothing, farming nothing region. Nothing going on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Down south by San Diego is all border. They're saying send them back. Um, <laughs> us in California, we're, we're or, I mean, Southern California, we're blinging it. Are those real or fake? And then we got the the coast uh, where they just Google everything. Mm -hmm. And I just love this because it is kind of, you know, we are quite a diverse group of people yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. But can we come together or not? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, especially driving up and down the state. I mean, it just, it, it, it really just boggles me every time and just how different, like different faces of California, like how, how very diverse the this, this state actually is. Uh, I need to make it up to a Merlot country a little bit more often, I think. Yeah, Merlot country <laughs> sounds pretty good. Stay away from weed country. Absolutely. <laughs> but we're going to take a look to, at some of the other news headlines made right here in the San Gabriel Valley. And now, CCN, Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now. If you hose down your driveway, drench your lawn, or use an open nozzle garden hose to wash your car, you could be up for a $500 a day fine starting in August. Despite pleas to reduce water use by 20% during this critical drought period, water use actually rose 1% in May. Most cities haven't come close near the 20% reduction. The fine was meant to be a way to distribute the burden of reducing water usage to include suburban residents and not just farmers, who account for 75% of state water consumption. Now here's a twi twist. There was a Glendora couple who um, was threatened by code enforcement with a $500 fine. Forget this, for having a brown lawn and not watering enough. You just can't win hmm. sometimes. Wow, imagine that. Well, despite passing earlier this month, war hero Louis Zamperina will still serve as a grand marshal of the upcoming Rose Parade. Uh, here's what Tournament of Roses Parade R President Richard Chinnon has to say about that. I did briefly meet him quite a few years ago, and he was speaking at a breakfast meeting. I did chat with him about his uh, his experiences, his experiences in running in the Olympics, his experiences in being a POW, his experiences post World War II, and uh, he was always very generous, very gracious, uh, very gregarious, full of life. And uh, we intend to honor Louis Zamperini as the 2015 Tournament of Roses Grand Marshal. What that looks like remains to be seen, um, but uh, that's our intent at this point in time. We're not rushing off or scrambling to try to find another Grand Marshal. He is the embodiment of this year's theme. You can catch the rest of our own Joe Trin's interview with Richard Chinnon on crowncitynews.com. The Colorado Bridge uh, was jumping on Saturday, June 12th from all those people partying. Pasadena Heritage celebrated its Colorado Bridge Party, which takes place every two years, and what a party it was. 
classic cars were on display, and kids had plenty of games to play. Bands played some great tunes that had their, our own Johnny Taylor jam to. Volunteers say this is a great event to be involved in. Well, I think what I'd most like you to know is how active we have been over 35 years to uh, preserve uh, Pasadena and its fabulous heritage. Uh, tonight we're celebrating the Colorado Street Bridge where we've been instrumental in keeping and preserving the bridge. The festival, which closes off traffic to the bridge, raises money for preservation of local historical sites. If you missed this year's event, you can catch it again. Next festival is in 2016. Now we're going to go to our morning buzz. Uh, one of the big topics right now is immigration, and we have attorney Patricia Corrales here joining us to talk about some Good of morning. those issues. Good morning. Um, this is such a big issue. I mean, it's, it's so heated across the country. Um, what's going on? Well, you know, um, I think there's been much to be uh, there's much to be said about this topic, and you're right. It's in the media almost daily about these undocumented or unaccompanied minors that are at our um, southwest border. And what I want to say about the topic really is um, it's not a question of illegal immigration. It's really a question of these individuals, these young kids fleeing their violent countries. It's a question of refugee. You know, people who are being persecuted in their country have a right to seek asylum and, ref you know, refuge in this country. And that's really what it is. And I think what's very, what I find very interesting is that much is being said about all these children. Um, and we are hearing from different segments of the news, uh, these baseless fears of these children are bringing uh, diseases mm -hmm. and um, the, what's going to happen to our economy, they're going to overflood our economy, the health issues involved. And where is this coming from? It's quite it's unfounded. baseless. It's unfounded. Mm -hmm. It's baseless. It's just striking fear in the American public. And we've, I, we've always done this to immigrants coming on our doors mm -hmm. from the very get-go. There's Absolutely. always been different groups that come. Suspicion. Absolutely, and I think you bring this, you bring up a, an issue that is very important, and I think the American public needs to be aware of this. In 1960, and between 1960 and 1962, did you know that 14,000 Cuban young children were sent here by their parents because they were, feel, uh, they were fleeing uh, communist Cuba? Mm -hmm. Now, back then in the 60s, the geopolitical situation was different. We were fearing communism, big bad communism, <coughs> but we took these children in, and we never we, we didn't have the kind of heated discussions that we're mm -hmm. having now having about today. the same Central American children that are coming to our country. What's the difference? Because the Cuban population are a politically active population. And they have a lot of political power. Or when this, we brought in the Chinese to help build our railroads, but didn't give them citizenship. So mm -hmm. at that point, it was OK for them to take our jobs. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The Central American children are coming from poor, you know, underdeveloped countries. And for that reason, we're somehow stigmatizing them. And you know, you mentioned that they're they're fleeing violence and they should be given refugee status. But some people are saying, are they just looking for uh, to, you know, get in through the loopholes to become get our citiz uh, citizenship rights? Um, that maybe if we send them back, then maybe those countries will fix some of the issues that are going on there versus, you know, just ignoring them and just uh, sending these children our way. Well, I think people have the. I think people are discussing this issue incorrectly. It's not a question of illegal immigration, as I said. It's really a question of refugee. Uh, these are children who are being sent by their parents because their parents are scared that these children will be either uh, killed, dismembered, or tortured because of the type of violence that's going down in their that's happening in their country. So they're seeking refuge in this country. To seek refuge, you can apply for political asylum. That's what this country is, is all about. Mm -hmm. They're not here. They're ten year olds. They're nine year olds. But I mean, are their parents? Are, are you know? Because there, this was a, a law passed uh, during George Bush's uh, administration, the previous Bush administration. And you know, I mean, obviously these are kids. They're, they're pawns in this whole thing. But I mean, are their are their parents? Uh, you know, have a strong understanding understanding of this loophole and is that why they're being sent? Well, you know, thank you for bringing that up. There is no loophole. These children would still have to seek asylum in this country. They would still have to establish that they have a, 
the legal basis to seek refugee status in this country. So there's really no loophole. They're just given an opportunity to be heard, their, their voice to be heard. Unlike previously, their voices weren't heard. Their voices were heard through attorneys or their parents. Now these children have a right to, to speak you know, the truth as to why they're fleeing their country. So because these children come here, it doesn't mean automatically that their parents, if their parents are here already and undocumented, that their parents are going to get any special um, legal uh, favors or illegal status because of that. So that's also something that I, I've noticed that there, the Republicans are trying to uh, put forth this, this notion that, oh, well, these children are getting special favors or the, uh, their parents are going to have a, some sort of special legal status above and beyond those who've been waiting in line to legally m immigrate in this country. That is not correct. Let me ask you this, and uh, you may or may not know, but uh, talk to me about a little bit of the, the conditions uh, upon being detained some of these children are, are being exposed to when, uh, when being detained at these border states. What an excellent question. Um, I previously worked for ICE. I was one of ICE's senior attorneys for many, many years. So there was a lawsuit that was uh, brought against uh, Border Patrol, uh, Customs and Border Patrol and Department of Homeland Security. And part of this lawsuit involved a settlement agreement where we, how are we going to treat, how is ICE or Department of Homeland Security going to treat these children? And as this, this lawsuit, uh, as part of this lawsuit, the requirement was that these children could not be detained with adults. They certainly have to be put in a shelter type situation. Mm -hmm. Social services had to uh, be seen, or they, uh, social service workers needs to see a child within 72 hours. So once they're apprehended at the border, CBP, Customs and Border Patrol, uh, will ask them several questions if they can speak and communicate with the child. And within 72 hours, that child is going to be seen, at least pursuant to this uh, the settlement agreement, by a social worker or a social uh, worker agency dealing with these undocumented yeah. and unaccompanied minors. Well, mm -hmm. I definitely understand that these are children, and we need to really look at it that at, um, them that way. But, you know, I think, um, I, I know that there's this video going out around, especially from uh, a number of uh, black residents in Chicago saying, you know, look at our area. We're devastated here in Chicago. There's so much crime. Um, you know, I'm scared. You know, a lot of the kids in, in the video that's going around are saying, I'm scared to be in my own streets. Where's the help for us? Mm -hmm. And that's a, a lot of the backlash that, you know, the Obama administration is facing um, with the funding that they're, uh, you know, proposing for uh, these children. Well, I do think one of the reasons that you're seeing such a flood or influx of children, and by the way, it's been happening for many years. It's, I think there's just much more attention to it now. Like I said, in the 60s, we had the same kind of flood mm -hmm. by Cuban children. But in regards to what you, you mentioned, um, these children are fleeing violent countries, and people say, well, it's violent here. There's gangs here. Yes, yeah. but we have law enforcement agencies here who actually do control and police. Mm -hmm. In those countries, point. they don't have that kind of law enforcement yeah. uh, And we policing. can go on and on about oh, it. We it, can. Is a, it is a hefty uh, topic, but we want to thank you for, for stopping by and chatting with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I okay. appreciate regardless it. Regardless of the situation, think of the kids. Exactly. Think of, uh, we're all humans, right? Absolutely. Thanks, thank Patricia. You. Thank you very much. Well, there's a cast of characters you should know before buying your first home. Lee Cuellar makes an introduction in his Your Home segment next. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. And now, CCN Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood starts right now.
Buying a home takes a whole cast of characters. Lee Cuellar introduces us to the players in his CCN segment, Your Home Segment. So you're buying a house. Wow, you're going to meet an awful lot of people in this process. A few of them are very, very important to the process. The first one is your real estate agent. Now, you want to make sure that they've been in business for a while and that they know exactly everything there is to know about the neighborhood where you're going to buy. They're going to, you're going to be spending an awful lot of time with this real estate agent. And just so you know, there's about 300 tasks that we perform between the time we start showing you properties and the time we close escrow. There's an awful lot to do. So uh, that second person is a mortgage loan officer. Now, this mortgage loan officer, they're going to make sure that you can borrow money to buy that dream house of yours. You're going to share all of your financial information with them, your work history, your credit scores, all of those things will determine how much money you can actually borrow. So let's say, for example, we found that dream house for you, we've submitted an offer, and we've gotten it accepted. Yay! How cool is that? So we go into what's called escrow. Escrow is the period of time it takes from the time the offer has been accepted until you actually close escrow and get the keys to your house. So that third person who's very important to this process is the escrow officer. I like to think of escrow as Switzerland. They collect documents, they collect money, and they disperse that money at the close of escrow. Now, the escrow officer and the escrow company, they cannot, they cannot act autonomously. They have to have mutual agreement from both the buyer and the seller before they can act. So that's, those are the three people that are very, very important to you in this uh, home buying process. I don't want to leave out the title officer. I almost forgot. The title officer is the person that makes sure that there are no liens or clouds on title. What that means to most of us is you're buying a house and let's say the owner is Fred Smith, right? Fred Smith should be on the, on the title as the owner and on the, uh, on the offer documents uh, when you're making an agreement. If he's not, you've got a real problem. So uh, let's say there's a lien for some, uh, for on title from a roofing company that did work on this property. So let's say five, six years ago, the homeowners did, uh, they replaced their roof and they never paid the roofing company. So there's, uh, the roofing company puts a lien on that title. Now, that lien has to be satisfied before you can actually sell the property. So that's something that you want to look at, and it's something that the title officer will point out to you during the escrow process. So those are the, those are the few key people in the, uh, in the home buying process. Sunita and Paulo, back to you. Well, Lee, I guess all of real estate is a stage and every player must know his part, right? That is absolutely true. I was just curious, Lee, um, now you said like each role is important and you can't work autonomous from the other role. Um, are there some cases where one refers, like say a title officer, like, and they work together on some deals? Is there, have you, do you see things like that happening where like it's a team that works together pretty much on every deal? Well, there's not really a, I can't say that there's really a team, Paolo. Uh, there is, uh, the homeowner does have the, the uh, right to choose which escrow company and which title company they, they choose to work with. But oftentimes, they'll, they'll probably refer somebody. Oftentimes, it's this, we work with the same people because we, we know that they're, they're very good at what they do. So we like to work with the same lenders, we like to work with the same physical inspectors, the same escrow companies, the same title officers, absolutely. Okay, and no matter how you cut it, you can't have a weak link in the chain. You cannot, or you won't end up in your dream home. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Well, thanks a lot, Lee. All right, and the way you handle a retirement depends on whether you're male or female. Mary Winters tells us more in her Senior Solutions segment. Please, is everybody? Light check. One, two, one, two. Everything looks good on our end. And lights. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Wow, these are really good. You act surprised.
practice makes perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. If you drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties. You could lose everything. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. shift in the makeup of men and women in the workplace today. Which has changed the way men transition into retirement. CCN's Mary Winters talks about the changes men face in her Senior Solutions segment. Hello, Mary. Well, what are these changes us men have to go through? Well, everybody transitions when they retire, and it's difficult. Difficult because it's change, and the people that we used to see every day are not there anymore. They're friends, they're, but they're professional colleagues. And now we've transitioned into a new phase in our life, and sometimes we're not prepared to really move forward with that transition. It's kind of jarring. That, it, whole, that whole transition, I would imagine. It really is, and oftentimes it's more difficult for men than it is for women. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it is more difficult for men than women oftentimes, mostly because women seem to have more responsibility in the household, as well as they stay more socially connected outside of the workplace. So men have a harder time in this transition for retirement. In addition, they have kind of a code of silence. So when they're not feeling well or they're not, they're not happy about this transition, they usually keep it to themselves. So unfortunately, we can see a lot of depression in men in this transition period. The unfortunate thing as well is we have the highest rate of successful suicides of men 70 plus. So it's really not something we want to fool around with. It's something we really want to consider and make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and making sure that we have purpose in our life. So in that transition period of retirement, make sure that you sit down with your financial advisor, you're feeling secure financially as you're transitioning over, and make sure that you're creating purpose. In other countries, they don't even talk about or they don't use the word retirement. It's just a transition period from one purpose in their life to another purpose in their life. So that may be gardening, that may be doing all kinds of things with family and friends. We also have transitions uh, where people uh, may benefit from just picking up the phone and calling others. Uh, stay busy, stay busy, it's very important. Stay healthy, make sure you're exercising, make sure that you are eating correctly. The other issue too is I think men become more sedentary in their retirement and it's important that we're taking care of ourselves and we're staying away from issues with hypertension and gaining weight. So in the transition period, just remember to have purpose and to reach out to others when you need the help and, and honestly get therapy if it's something that you really do need in that transition. It may just be a very short period of time. So please make sure you take care of yourself in that transition period. So I guess it's safe to say men just have a hard time dealing with change then. They do, <laughs> and women are typically can multitask a little bit better than men too. They're more much, adaptable, yada, yada, yeah. yada. Well, I think so. men, you know, they. Thinking of retirement, you think about all the things that you can't do when you know you're working away, and some of that is like I would just love to go home, sit, and watch some TV, and that's and then, great for maybe day one, day two. But when you know that starts to being a habit, and you're not adding other things in. That's when correct. it gets a little depressing, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. That's when the couch potato sets in. It happens at all ages. Right. I look exactly. forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna have to get I'm you out. Barely, It'll all come I've for all of us. I've already started in the workforce. I'm already looking forward to retirement. We're gonna be banging at the door. Paulo, get off! Get off that couch! Exactly. I'll try to have some Call projects. Us. I'll try to have some projects in line for when that happens. Make sure that make sure you do. Make yeah. sure you and do that. And just really help. volunteer. I think that would be a key. Absolutely. Thing. Well, that's it for our show. We'd like to thank our.
sponsors, Southern California Edison, EH Financial, Senior Providers Network, and Pasadena Federal Credit Union, and Ability First for sponsoring our show. And thank you to all the CCN Sunrise crew and you, the viewers. See you next week.